Hey everybody, this video is a response to a video that's been circulating the internet from a teacher who is trying to show parents how to help the, their students with two-digit multiplication. For parents who felt like they learned the concept in a different way so they then couldn't help with homework, that video was a resource for them. And so she presented the problem 35 times 12 using what she called an area model. And the problem was, or the response was that a lot of parents seemed very upset saying like, God, doesn't she know that there's an easier way to do this problem? I just did it in five seconds. Okay, the answer is she probably does know that there's a faster way to do the problem and there's probably a pretty good reason that she chose to present the uh, problem the way that she did. So in this video, I'm gonna lay out the different ways to do 35 times 12 and talk about how some of them are better for assisting with future math than others and some of them are better at building up number sense than others. And then I'm gonna end the video with just some general advice about how you can talk with the elementary school student in your life about math in a way that's going to foster their creativity, build up their number sense, and generally set them up for success in the future. Okay, so first let's look at how I learned how to uh, do two-digit multiplication. So first I knew I would do two times six, so I bring down the two, and I'll carry the one. And then two times three is six, and then six plus that carried one is seven. And then I knew I needed to put down a zero, and then do one times six is six, one times three is three, and then I can just add those two numbers together to get 432. Now let's look at how the teacher in the video laid out this problem. So she split it up into 30 plus six and 10 plus two, and then drew this box. And then 10 times 30, that's 300. 10 times six is 60. And then two times 30 is 60, and two times six is 12. And then if we add those four numbers together, we get 432. And a lot of the comments on the video thought that this was a very silly way to lay out the problem because it takes a lot longer, you have to draw the box. Why wouldn't you just do it the easier way? So first, let's look at the potential downfalls of the way that I learned this when I was in elementary school. So when you do two times six, you do bring down the two and carry the one. But what a lot of students struggle to picture is why they're carrying a one. What is that one? So two times six, that's 12. So I have one 10 and two ones. So I put down my two ones in my ones place and then I carry that 10. Because then when I do two times 30, I have three tens times two is gonna give me six more tens for a total of seven tens and two ones, which is 72. So when we do it the way I learned in elementary school, it's a lot harder to picture what's actually going on when you're doing two digit multiplication. But in the area model, it's very clear that you're multiplying every piece by every other piece to get your final answer. I think it's a lot easier with this method, the method that I learned in elementary school, to get an answer without fully understanding exactly what you're doing. And we want our students to be able to understand what they're doing while they're doing it. But of course, I wouldn't expect students to do an area model for every multiplication problem, and I wouldn't expect them to use the same method for every problem. Instead, we should look at many different ways to solve problems. So for example, 36 times 12, we could do 40 times 12, which is 480, but we know that we don't want 40 times 12. We actually want four less 12s than that. So we're gonna subtract 48. So 480 minus 48 is 432. Or 15 times 29. Again, I wouldn't use either of those methods. Instead, I would say 15 times 30 is pretty easy to figure out. That's 450. And then I'm gonna subtract one of those 15s to get 435. So we want our students to be able to approach problems in many different ways, and we don't wanna invalidate any of those ways. We want them to be able to play with the numbers. Saying one way is better than the other, I think is kind of similar to walking by somebody climbing a mountain and saying, well, look at that idiot. Doesn't he know that there's an easier way to get from point A to point B? Obviously, there's a reason for doing the harder way or a way that takes longer. We wanna be able to get something out of it. So let's look at how the area model way corresponds with something we learn in high school math. So here we have what we call two binomials that we want to multiply together. And this type of thing has a lot of applications in algebra two and ends up being pretty important in later math classes as well. And students really wanna say that x plus two times x plus five is actually x squared plus 10. But that's not the case. If we actually set up an area model, it's pretty easy to see that it's x squared plus two x plus five x plus 10. And I wouldn't want students to set up an area model every time they multiply binomials, but at first it's a good way for them to accept the result and see what they're doing. And if they're already used to thinking about multiplication in several different ways, then this is, they'll be much better at this type of thing when they get to high school. So we wanna think about the future and what benefit they get out of pro solving problems in different ways. 
So instead of thinking one way is better than the other, I think it's really good for students to look at many different ways to represent numbers. Like for example, 235 can be represented as 47 times five, and 50 times five minus three times five, and 40 times five plus seven times five. All three of those will lead to 235 as an answer. Or we can do 47 times 10 divided by two. 470 divided by two is 235. And when we let them play with numbers in this way, they start to develop algebra skills that will help them when we start to replace numbers with variables. So instead of 47 times 10 divided by 2, now we have 47 times x divided by 2 equals 235, and they're asked to solve for x. If they already have a really solid number sense and really solid algebra skills, then this type of thing isn't too hard for them. Or we can say instead of letting it equal 235, let's let it equal y and let x be whatever we want it to be. So what happens when we let x equal 12? Well, then we know, okay, we're doing 47 times 6, basically, and that's going to be close to 50 times 6, which is 300. And then we're going to subtract 3 times 6, so we get 300 minus 18, which is 282. And now students can start to think about linear relationships, and they can start thinking about algebra on a deeper level. But if they don't have a solid foundation and they don't have solid number sense, then this type of thing actually ends up being really hard for some of the high school students. Now I want to talk about some general advice for how you can talk to your kids about math in a way that's going to set them up for success in the future. So the biggest problem I see with high school students is they don't want to be wrong in front of people. So they're not going to say their answer unless they're 100% sure it's correct. They don't like taking that risk. They also don't ask questions. So they're either not good at finding the right question or they just don't like asking questions in front of other people and showing them that they don't understand something. And a lot of kids really just want the steps to get to a correct answer. They don't care about, well, conceptually why the steps are working. They just want to memorize the steps so they can get the answer. And if we think about the benefit of math, well, memorizing those steps is going to help them maybe for the next test, but not in the future. Whereas if they're thinking about it conceptually, that will stay with them. And also that's going to help them build up critical thinking skills. So the first piece of advice I have is to not invalidate certain ways of doing a problem. So if your student brings home your homework and you're looking at it and it's different from the way you learned it, you shouldn't say, oh my God, this is so stupid. Let me show you this easier way that I learned. It's much quicker. Instead, you can say, that looks interesting. Would you like to hear how I learned it when I was in school? Maybe we can compare the two ways and see why they lead to the same answer. Oh, your teacher is representing 35 times 12 as area of a rectangle. What else might 35 times 12 represent? Those conversations and activities are going to help your kid build up number sense and also encourage them to take on problems in many different ways, which is going to be important later on. Second piece of advice is you can talk to them about math during your everyday activities. So if you're at the grocery store buying pasta for your teenager's cross-country team dinner later, you can ask them, how much pasta do you think we should buy for the team tonight? And then they can think like, well, how much pasta do you normally buy when you're cooking for our family? And how many kids are there on the cross country team? And then they can use number sense and reasoning to make a guess about how many boxes you should buy. And then maybe, and maybe not, but maybe they're a little bit more invested in this dinner now because as people are eating and finishing up, they're gonna see how close their guess was. And when you're driving somewhere, you can say, uh, how long do you think it's gonna take us to get there? And then they can think like, okay, well, I know how long it normally takes us to get to school. Like, how far is school from our house? And how far away is this place that we're going? And then they can use some reasoning and number sense to make a guess about how long the trip's gonna take. And then again, maybe they're a little more invested in the car right now. They're like looking at the timer and they're, they're gonna see how close their guess is. And then if their guess is off, you can have a conversation with them about the different factors that might have led to their guess being wrong. And then next time they get in the car, they can try again and you can track their progress. And then as they get older, you can ask them more involved questions or slightly harder questions. Uh, and then they, when they're building up number sense in their everyday life, that's gonna help them when they go to school and they have to use those number sense skills. Third piece of advice, validate the struggle they feel when they're learning. This is really important. High school kids really can't handle it when they don't understand something, especially if it's the first time they don't understand something. So whenever students struggle, we should make sure they know that's an absolutely essential part of the growth process and the learning process. If they're struggling, that means they're challenged. And so if we can frame that in a positive way, then they won't, they won't necessarily feel bad about themselves, but they'll know that that's important and that they're going to learn. Every time they fight through that struggle, they can know that their brain's going to grow a little bit and they're going to be a little bit better than they were before. So then when they get to high school and things get, uh, get a little bit harder, they're ready to take on those types of challenges with a positive attitude and they'll believe that they can overcome those challenges. Last piece of advice is stress the importance of math. So this is actually, uh, some parents tend to talk about how math isn't that important when their kid is struggling because they want them to feel better. Like, okay, if you don't understand this, just know that I don't use math in my everyday life, so you'll be fine. 
you're not necessarily wrong. It's true. If they don't learn math at a high level, then they probably will be fine. But you don't want to uh, eliminate options for them. So you can say, you can be honest with them and you can say, yeah, I, I use math sometimes. You can tell them when you use it in your job and in everyday life. And then you can say, yeah, but just because I don't use all this math, that doesn't mean that it's not important. So you can talk about how math has been really important for all of the, most of the major innovations that have happened in human history. And the more math they know, the more likely they can be a part of that conversation and the more job opportunities they're gonna have. But if you tell them, oh, math isn't important or you don't stress the importance of math, then you could be essentially cutting them out of the conversation and setting them up for failure in their future math classes. They need to see, uh, have that positive message coming from a lot of different directions and it means a lot coming from the parents. So that's it. I mean, frustrated parents, I hear you. We're all crying out for a better education for our kids. In this video, I think I've laid out a few easy things we can do to send a positive message to them and set them up for success in their future math classes. Thanks for watching.